Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Grace, mercy, peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen one who teaches us how to pray in celebratory times and otherwise. Amen. Our focus for this morning is a continuation of a conversation, first of all, larger conversation we've been having over the past several months about prayer, and particularly during the season of Lent, from Ash Wednesday to midweek Lenten services to Holy Week, what does it look like to pray? How can we model our prayer lives after the prayer life of Jesus? Where do we see him at prayer? We certainly see him in specific moments, like before he starts his ministry and chooses his disciples. We see him at prayer after he sent out the 72 to be his advance team and tell people the kingdom is coming before he gets there. We see Jesus at prayer out front and in front of everybody, very publicly, verbally. And we see Jesus at prayer very quietly, very intimately, sometimes without even the words recorded. We see Jesus at prayer constantly because he is constantly, consistently in communication with his Father. There's a relationship there. And there, this is no different on a day like today, on Easter. When we're celebrating a victory, it's a good time to pray. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present, that we may all hear a good word from you. Amen. So I want to start our, our conversation in God's Word this morning with kind of a fun question. Here's the question. Have you ever met a celebrity? Anybody ever met a celebrity? I'm sure you have some stories you could tell about that. Maybe we get to those later, but for the time being, think about how this normally happens. Some of these situations are very contrived, right? You can buy the opportunity to have a meet and greet with a celebrity. Maybe you buy a backstage pass to, uh, to a concert, or there's a, a meet and greet with some athletes where there's gonna, they're going to be signing autographs. I did that once. Uh, maybe you, are, uh, you get a chance to, uh, to go to spring training for, for baseball, and you know that it's going to be an opportunity if you take a, a, a few baseballs along. There's going to be an opportunity to hobnob a little bit and get a few signatures. I know a few people around here who like to do that. Or maybe after a concert or something like that, you, you find the tour bus and you camp out and you hope you get a, a glimpse and maybe just a snatch of a conversation with a celebrity. Well, as, as much as society will say there's a reason why this person is important, they're a VIP, they are better looking or better at something or in some way on a higher level than everybody else, you know well as I do that they put their pants on the same way as everybody else, right? And so some of the most uh, amazing interactions that people have with celebrities are ones that happen very organically, just bumping into someone on the street. And sometimes they don't even know that that's the person they're bumping into. That's when, it, when it's really, it dawns on somebody. Now, Obviously, it's hard to manufacture that for TV, but I think that Jimmy Fallon and the crew over at The Tonight Show do a pretty good job of that. I've got a little clip here, and I think we'll see some parallels between this situation that he sets up and the very organic reactions that he gets and the story that we're going to hear in just a second. So give this a watch. Isn't that great? Isn't that so much fun? couple of them, there's many things we could unpack from this, this clip, and there's a reason why we're doing this. Um, so a couple things to, to know, just to, to point out. First of all, uh, you have U2, one of the most recognized bands on the planet, and they're hiding in plain sight. They're playing at one of the most well-traveled areas, in, probably in the world, and nobody sees who they are. They're, they're hidden in plain sight. And a couple things stand out to me. First of all, they start to get recognized not by their appearance, but by the very distinctive vocals of Bono and the very distinctive licks of The Edge on his guitar. That's the thing that makes people start to go, oh, there's something happening here. And the second thing is, did you notice how the, the tone of the entire subway station changed once the disguises came off? And it turned into a party. You see that little kid dancing? I'm like, I wish I could dance like that. He's like, man, there's a party here, and I want to be part of it. 
I think if any of that resonates with you, then we're going to be in a good spot to start looking at the Gospel of Luke because the story of Jesus certainly includes what we heard in Mark, the resurrection story, but it wasn't just Easter morning. It was Easter afternoon and evening again. And we have this account of these two disciples who are walking down the road to Emmaus, so a well-traveled area, probably not as as well-traveled as the 42nd Street Station in New York City, but well-traveled, and they have a chance encounter with with Jesus. When Jesus meets them, I'm guessing that they probably could have heard that song, that first song. I still haven't found what I'm looking for and just been like, yeah, that's right. We haven't found what we're looking for yet. It hasn't happened. And Jesus meets them on the road and he kind of plays coy with them a little bit. He kind of says, well, you know, what's, what's this? Why are you so downcast? Why are you so sad? And they're kind of like, are you the only guy in in this area who's not heard about what's happened in Jerusalem in these past few days about this Jesus of Nazareth guy? And Jesus kind of is like, no, tell me the story. He puts the, the emphasis on them, lets them tell the story. And so they say, we thought this was it. We thought this was the guy to set all things right, to save the world. This was the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And our chief priests and teachers decided to put him to death. That's what happened. It was, it's heartbreaking. That's why we're so conflicted right now, because there's more to the story, and we don't know what to think of it. We heard from some of our crew that just today they saw Jesus alive. It's been reported. And so we're trying to figure this out. We don't know what to make of it. And Jesus steps in and he says, well, let me unpack for you what this is all about. And they still don't recognize him. And he gives a master class on Old Testament prophecy, how all this started, how everything that pointed to the Messiah, and how the Messiah came in the person of Jesus Christ, the cross, the empty tomb. This is the story. And Jesus draws the lines, connects the dots between all these accounts, and it's beautiful and glorious. And these two guys can't stop listening to him. Now, this is where we're going to pick it up in Luke 24. It says they came near the village where they were going, these two guys, and Jesus gave the impression that he was going further. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. Read, Jesus, you got to eat, right? You got to find some place to stay. And this conversation is so good, we can't stop. Just like, let's keep this good thing going. So Jesus goes in to stay with them. And it was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Now let's pause on this for just a second, because I know that I mentioned at the beginning of this message, we're talking about prayer, and specifically where we see Jesus at prayer. Now if you look at that closely, you don't see those words, Jesus prayed. But if you read the Gospel of Luke, or any of the Gospels really, you'll come to notice that whenever Jesus is doing table service of some sort, that there are these same kind of elements that pop up over and over again. That he breaks bread, that he gives it to people, that he asks a blessing, that he gives thanks. All these different things rolled up in one. So it's not surprising that we don't see Jesus prayed in this spot, but this is certainly a a place where we see Jesus at prayer because he's celebrating the victory with two guys who don't even know that it's him. Whether he is he is breaking bread with 5,000 people on a hillside and teaching them about the kingdom of God, or he's having this intimate moment in an upper room with his closest followers and instituting the Lord's Supper, he gives thanks. And there's a reason why this thing that we call the Lord's Supper is often also called the Eucharist. Taken from the Greek word eucharisteo, translated, I give thanks. Whenever Jesus breaks bread, whenever he gives to his disciples to feed them body and soul, he gives thanks. It's just hand in hand with how this works. Eucharisteo, I give thanks. These two guys don't yet know how much they have to be thankful for because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. They don't yet see it. And yet they're looking straight at it. Eucharisteo, I give thanks. This is the posture of prayer when we gather around a table. 
And that leads me to another really good point here. We talk here at Emmanuel about two important places that the kingdom of God comes to us. It happens in temple spaces and in table spaces. Now, it's very clear to see God at work in temple spaces like this. But this is not where we spend the bulk of our time as God's people. The kingdom comes among us at every table that we sit down at every day of the week. And so every time we gather around a table, the kingdom comes with us, and it's an opportunity for celebration. Jesus invites us to give thanks for what he's done for us, to ask a blessing, and then to enjoy what God gives us in the places where we live and work and play, not just here. And so we have plenty to give thanks for, and these disciples are just about to wake up to how good they actually have it. Let's keep on going. Jesus breaks the bread, gives it to them, gives thanks. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him like, whoa! But he disappeared from their sight. Poof! And after they pick their jaws off the floor, they say, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? There was a party going on there. It changed the tone completely. We were downcast and saying, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And then Jesus shows up and he connects the dots and we go, ah, this is what I've been looking for. That very hour, these two guys got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11, the 12 disciples minus Judas, and those with them gathered together. All the ones who said, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Eyewitnesses and those who heard the message. And then these two guys began to describe what had happened on the road and how Jesus made himself known to them in the breaking of the bread. It wasn't his appearance that tipped them off. It was what he did. He broke the bread. He gave it to them. He gave thanks. He gave them the blessing of himself. What's the good news for us on Easter? There's many different ways you can put it, but in this context, the good news I hear is that Jesus is fully, completely present here with us right now in this moment. He's fully present. We see it in the means of grace, in God's word spoken from scripture and preached and heard and imbibed. We also see it in the the Lord's Supper as God attaches his promises to bread and wine so that we receive those promises in these simple elements. God is at work. He's here. He's present. And he is alive in our hearts. This whole day is all about death to life. And God enlivens us by feeding us with his promises and all manner of good things. Jesus, in that life, is still teaching us how to pray. So what does a prayer with Jesus 